to welcome you to the Medical Center Hour and Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here at the School of Medicine and we're delighted to see all of you here today. This is the first of two programs that's going to focus rather as our first program this fall did on place. Uh, the sense of place and the idea of place as more than just geography but having a very very much to do with who we are, what our well-being is like, and what our heritage, but also our future, uh, happen to be. The place we're talking about today is Southern Appalachia, and the program title gives you some hint of uh, the tone of today's uh, discussion, and that is Unhealthy Appalachia. So Southern Appalachia often provides a folksy backstory to our national mythology, a tale of coal miners, moonshining, bluegrass, and ballads. But Appalachia is a real place that figures fundamentally in this country's heritage and destiny. Its rugged mountains are rich in natural resources, while its remote communities are home to some of the nation's most fiercely proud people, most distinctive regional culture, and most persistent <coughs> poverty. Southern Appalachia has endowed American culture and indeed the University of Virginia with a wealth of gifts and innovations, but itself faces staggering difficulties. Embracing Appalachia is challenging, and perhaps never more so than now, as the coal industry disappears and the region's long-standing crises of geographic isolation and environmental degradation distrust of outside interests, poor health, and poverty deepen. This Medical Center Hour with West Virginia Coalfields native David Gordon probes our particular connections with Appalachia and how the enduring tragedy of this place is a canary in the coal mine for the rest of our nation. David Gordon is UVA's Director of Telemedicine and Rural Network Development and Co-Director of the Healthy Appalachia Institute at UVA WISE. He's also an instructor in the Medical School's Department of Public Health Sciences and in the School of Nursing. Uh, I need to tell you he has no financial conflicts of interest relative to his presentation. <laughs> With him, we'll inquire into whether healthy Appalachia is possible. If so, what will that take? For us at the University of Virginia, what does Appalachia mean? And what can, what must we do to help? I'd like to offer thanks today for the several co-sponsors of this program, including the Center for Global Health, which means global health is not only around the world, but just around the corner. The Institute for the Humanities and Global Cultures, which is just beginning a what they call a Global South initiative that is so beautifully, vaguely conceived that Appalachia falls in the Global South as well. The Department of Public Health Sciences and the Healthy Appalachia Institute. Um, and now David uh, Gordon uh, will talk with us about unhealthy Appalachia. Welcome, David. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you so much, and I, I really am honored to be here today, um, to be surrounded um, by a lot of friends and colleagues. Um, thank you for being here. Um, for those of you who know me, I love pulpits, um, and I've got one here, so Southern Appalachia preacher roots. Um, I thought we would do some snake handling, which is a fine tradition, so those of you in the first rows, uh, yeah, I promise. Um, but I really am honored to be here and to talk about this subject um, that is near and dear to my heart, and that is Appalachia and what it means. Um, I wear a lot of hats, as, as Marcia indicated, in telemedicine and rural network development and in teaching, um, but I really want to wear my real bona fides today. I don't know who saw Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Famous scene where, where George Clooney's trying to get back his wife's good graces and the daughter says, uh, of the new boyfriend, Mama says he's bona fide. 
Well, I'm bona fide. Born and bred in Bluefield, West Virginia, home of the best coal in the world, Pocahontas number no. 9 bituminous coal. Beautiful coal. We used to have to shovel the stoke her at night to keep our house warm. Uh, five cents a ton, they dump it in the basement, and I'd shovel it in, come take my bath. But I'm proud of those dates. What are those dates? Championships. You're damn right. It's <laughs> high school championships. Uh, and that gives me, and this is a thing about place. Where you're from matters. When you go into Appalachia, when we take care of people from Appalachia, one of the first questions they always ask is, where are you from? And that's what opens relationship, not what do you do, but where are you from? So what we're going to look at today is the power of that place. What our particular relationship is to Appalachia by sitting in this room and working in this place and being connected to this community to talk about what the common understandings of health in Appalachia are, to look at what our toolbox is as we approach um, Appalachia and the people of Appalachia and review the current health status of the region. And really, uh, this is a bullet pulpit today. So a good part of this will be challenge to all of us um, as to where we go. Because the mountains shape people's lives, both literally and figuratively. We see them every day. They shape our lives. And they clearly separate an Appalachian culture that has a sense of place. And so I want to talk about that place. Um, one of the things I want to say, and there are some folks here who know well this next thing that's coming, and that's how we say it. Because um, it distinguishes you. It's not that Appalachia is wrong. It's just that Appalachia is right. <laughs> um, folks from Southern Appalachia, by and large, um, prefer it to say, if you don't say Appalachia, I will throw an Appalachia. Throw an Appalachia. That's the way you've got to try to remember this. Um, it's like if you were in Northern Ireland, you stopped in to see a merchant, you said, I need to get to Londonderry, he would know something about you by that. He would still give you the directions. But if you came in there and said, I need to get to Derry, uh, he would really know something about you. And in the same way, people from Southern Appalachia will know something about you by saying Appalachia. Um, that is to say that if you want to know the way up the mountain, if we want to take care of people from Appalachia in this great place, then we have to ask the people who travel those mountains how you get up them, what you see from the top. That's critical. So what is Appalachia? Well, it's a region that stretches from New York State, where they say Appalachia, um, all the way down into Mississippi. It is a huge section of this country with 23 million people. Um, the counties that you see there in red are federally distressed counties. They're the poorest of the poorest counties in the United States. The peachy colored ones are in transition down, not up. As Marcia said, coal mining closing, especially in central Appalachia. Uh, for those of you listening to NPR yesterday, Alpha Natural Resources, the largest coal company in the world, which is now bankrupt, mind you, announced that it's closing six underground mines in Dickinson County, which means 60 more miners laid off. Those are the only jobs that pay 50 plus K per year. Um, it devastates Dickinson County. And so those transition counties will become red counties. So that's, that's the lay of the land. Now I'll make another point in this slide, which is very important. It's our freaking neighborhood, okay? Look at where the University of Virginia sits. We sit proximate to 15 Appalachian <coughs> counties, federally designated Appalachian counties. And, and this is where I get a little lofty in the pulpit and say, hey, guess what? Thomas Jefferson was an Appalachian. He was born in the mountains. Born in the mountains, he chose to build his university in the mountains from people from the mountains, slaves who lived in the mountains, of materials from the mountains. That's what built this university in order to educate kids from the mountains to go out 
into rural egalitarian villages and be healthy and to be wise. So we are a part of the Appalachian tradition. Only The only trouble is our, our compass is set northeast, isn't it? Um, and, and we need, and what I challenge you today is to reset your compass or some part of your compass southwest. Um, how many of you um, either went to or worked at or applied to an Appalachian University? Um, so, Pam, where did you go? West Virginia? <laughs> Yes. Somebody else? Yes? Um, I live close to Frostburg State University. I'm there, so that's way out. Oh, yeah. Frostburg State. Other ones. <laughs> we went to Concord University. Athens, West Virginia. <laughs> All right. Somebody else I know hung out there. <laughs> um, so here is it. What about you, Marsha? UVA. UVA. <laughs> So everybody in this, everybody put your hand up, please. Everybody. We are connected to a great Appalachian University, and we need to think of it that way. And look, we actually have a college where we have to cross two rows of mountains and a lot of curvy roads and go by Ma and Pa's and get a burger on the way. Um, Wise, the college at Wise, where people in this university and I guess it's okay to say, right? There were a few people who didn't want to be connected to Clinch Valley uh, College, right? Um, but it is part of us. They are a college of the university, and they are embedded in the middle of the coal fields. And it is something that we can be very proud of. And a lot of us here have made that trip. How many people in this room have worked at Graham? a goodly number of us. For 15 years, I believe this is the 15 year mark, we've had a little struggle of late, which is often the way it is, but I think I will never forget what it means I, I got one year to wash the flex sigs um, as they were coming out of the exhibition hall where people in four stalls were getting flex sig procedures done after having done a colon prep in a porta potty they were sharing with 7,000 of their closest friends. <laughs> Healthcare in America, people in a lawn chair under, under a tent having their teeth removed. Um, it is a powerful experience for all of us who became a part of unhealthy Appalachia. But what did we find? We also found a very healthy Appalachia. People we loved. A place that was beautiful. Some place that we wanted to go back year after year because you could palpably feel the love by being a part of that experience. So what are the some common <coughs> facts about that environment in which we do healthcare? Well, like I said, 23 million people. There are not very many big cities. Uh, Pittsburgh, which I, I see Pittsburgh sort of is the love child between Paris and San Francisco that was given up for adoption and raised by a family in West Virginia. Um, right, Brian? It's kind of a crazy Appalachian city. Highly recommend it. But it's really mostly small, isolated towns. Hayside, Dant, not Dante. It is tripping to hell, but it's Dant. Um, Williamson, West Virginia, beautiful places, but very isolated. They tell me that Hayside, the mythology of Hayside is that it's named Hayside because there was a single ferry across the Clinch River there run by a guy named Cy. Hey, Cy! <laughs> I don't know that that's true. Um, but there's a historic shortage of professional services, healthcare services, small rural hospitals, Dickinson Hospital, the critical access hospital in the county where they shut the underground mines down, has two beds. You're having a heart attack, you're not going to stop there, but you're an hour away from the hospital where they're going to chop you to some other hospital. You're way 
in an isolated environment. There's very minimal mental health care. There are greater than 2,000 people per dentist in the region. Um, they gave me, for all of us who do HRSA grants and have to do mooses and hipses, um, Appalachia gave meaning to moosa and hipsa. They, they created the term. There are high rates of disabilities. There's poor pain management. And what is true of Appalachia is that the people in Virginia and Southwest Virginia have more in common with the people in Kentucky and Tennessee um, and, and West Virginia than they do with us here in Albemarle County, where they often come and get their hair care. Um, the cultural factors then that fix into this. I, I want to give a shout out to David Mann who most of these uh, photographs are. He's an Appalachian guy, and he's a wonderful photographer, and his, many of these portraits throughout my presentation are, are by David. Um, there's just a general mistrust of systems. When forever people have been coming in, as they did, to take all the timber, there are no old growth forests in Appalachia, because they came and they take it and they built, built the railroads, and then they came back, and they went down into the mountains and they took the coal. Uh, billions and billions and billions of dollars of resources that left the region uh, in order to build this nation, in order to have the lights on here, in order to run this university, in order to run this nation, left that part of the world. And they sit in poverty. And we have to decide where we stand in relationship to that. And so it's no wonder when they're a patient on our ward that maybe there's a little mistrust. Um, they have a fear of being taken advantage of. The avoidance of care. There's a new Virginia Department of Health study out about breast cancer. Um, and women avoid treatment, even post-diagnosis, because they because of fear of the system. But but greater what it would mean to their resources and their ability to take care of their families. Um, trust for people in Appalachia tend to be local. Uh, being one of us matters. So in however you might think about this, there's another view of the mountain that I want you to consider. Every day I get to see Carter's Mountain. When I get up, it is the most beautiful sight. I love the mountains that we all see in this neighborhood. It's important, let me point out, that those mountains are 300 million years old. They occurred when the African plate collided with the North American plate, pushed it up, pushed the forest underneath to create the coal. And those mountains at one time were as high as the Himalayas. They were 30,000 feet high, these mountains. And so what we see is a ruin, and it's a beautiful ruin every year. Every, every, every day we see it. It's a beautiful run. It's like being in Rome. Just the mountains, Rome. And so we need to see the beauty of that, but we also need to see the other side of this mountain and the other story, that it's also about loss. It's a place of exploitation and poverty and disasters and that persistent lack of access to education and health care have taken their toll for the people in the coal fields. Simply put, place matters. So what is Appalachia? So when I say that word, what does it conjure up for you? Appalachia. Somebody. Music. Music. Yes. Beautiful music. Always music. First and last music. What else? Crafts. Crafts. Done by hand that work, that fine shaping of a bowl, that making of a doll out of a corn husk, um, creative use of that which is around them. Uh, Robert Wilson, the famous uh, Nobel laureate from Harvard who talks about the environment, sees within Appalachia one of those unique places where the human being is embedded within ecology, that you cannot separate it. And it, so it generates this music and this craft. What else? Moon, moonshine. It's okay to say, Brian. Moonshine. Um, coal. Hillbillies. Banjo picking. Right? Uh, Wanda and I were talking earlier. You know, us West Virginians, we tell West Virginia jokes. 
we tell some of the best West Virginia jokes. Um, we're talking about hillbilly culture. There are few cultures in, in our American life and mythology that get trashed as much as hillbilly culture. How do you tell that bride at that hillbilly wife? Well, she's the one with the braided armpit hair. You know, these are the common things that I grew up with. Um, Lil Abner in the Sunday newspaper, uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, who, there's a few people I see who are old enough to remember the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, but even in new generations, how about that Appalachian emergency room where you go in there and turn the camera on and just watch the fun on a Saturday night in the Appalachian community? Um, there's that, that famous woman. Her name was uh, Lindsay uh, Kennedy, that person down there at the bottom from Abu Ghraib Prison. You remember her? She's the one that made fun of all the naked guys tied up with the hoods on their heads. She was from Palestine, West Virginia. Um, fine person that we made fun of in the press. Moonshine still, snake handling still goes on. NASCAR, these things are still true about hillbilly culture. Now, I don't know what this thing means at the bottom. I just found this as a statement that um, hillbilly culture is the liminal, primitive, white icons of ambivalence about modernity's progress and its American discontents. Whatever the hell that means, it's not good. Um, but there's another side, and this is the point about Appalachia. This is the point about what we do in healthcare every day, especially when we work with unique culture and people in poverty, and that is um, to understand the upside in all this. Am I pushing the wrong buttons, John? Yeah. <laughs> um, a long time ago, Washington Irving, you guys mostly heard of Washington Irving, sort of wondered, why in the hell do we live in the United States of America? Why are we named America? So I ask students every year in my class, I say, eh, America. So that's named after Amerigo Vespucci, someone we all love and revere. Marsha has a portrait of him in his, her dining room. You know, the hell, Amerigo Vespucci. Um, and so Washington Urban started a moment, movement. He got the Transcendentalists on board to want to name this after a place that has meaning to who we are. And so put before Congress a constitutional amendment to rename us the United States of Appalachia. How about that? Uh, Marcia said it might have blunted our movement toward California, but, um, but Appalachia is where we gained our roots, we put our feet down, we generated ideas and, and the expression of music of Dr. Ralph Stanley or Mahalia Jackson or uh, Nina Simone, my great Appalachian champion. Who would have known that Nina Simone was an Appalachian? Uh, Jimmy Rogers, Mother Maybell Carter, the invention of country and western music, uh, Thomas Wolfe, the great American novelist, Pearl Buck, the Waltons, good night, boy. Um, you know, great athletes, great writers, um, that other woman, Jessica Lynch, who also during the Iraqi war was also from a small town in West Virginia, thought that was an interesting point of contrast. But there is powerful we go out from these hills and find and shape the great America of our discovery. So it is both things. So how then, when we have a patient in the ward, when we connect to clinics and to consulting physicians, to people from the region, to students from that region or here, how do we approach? What is in our toolkit? And I think this is important. Place matters. We begin with an understanding of that place is fundamental and that language is born of this place. Um, Anne Marie and I, a long time ago, did a presentation uh, 20 years ago, I think, more than 20 years ago, on the clash of cultures between West Virginia culture and tertiary care culture. Um, and 
It all started with me when I got on an elevator with a family from West Virginia who had never been in an elevator before. There was no elevator in their community. Imagine what it is then to be in a cardiac care unit trying to keep the only thing that seemed at home was the cream uh, gravy over biscuit. That was the one thing that made them happy in that CCU. But we need to know their language, their understanding begins in place. It then moves to the ability, if you know their history, to form relationship, to be open to the loss and understanding the loss of living in an extractive economy. All right to not do extractive work as we as researchers, when we go down and we take the data and leave, is no different than taking the coal and leaving. And most importantly, in taking this route to embrace and engage the contradictions of the culture. <laughs> contradictions are the way in. As Pascal says, a contradiction is not a sign of falsity, nor the lack of contradiction a sign of truth. Funny guy, Pascal. Um, these things, these statements of contradiction are indeed the riches of this culture. This is how it has been so fundamental to the heart of, of our nation, <laughs> fundamental to us as individuals who have been fortunate enough to be a part of it. There is power in holding these things together and understanding the contradictions because it is embedded within that that we can do something. But if we fail to see that, if we go to the stereotype on one side or we go to the absolute certainty of the great arts on the other, we will fail. You only win when you hold these things together, whether it's poverty and great wealth at the same time, the love of peace, place and the required mass migration, this profound egalitarianism that you find in mountains, and a clerk uh, sitting in a county clerk's office who says she won't give uh, wedding certificates to uh, gay people. This is, this is a contradictions of Appalachia. Um, and so it is important to always begin with an understanding of the contradictions. Knowing that, what are our imperatives for engagement? Do we have imperatives? Do we, as this University of Virginia, have a responsibility to Central Appalachia, to Appalachia as a whole, to our neighbors out there? And of course we do. Everybody in this room would say, of course we do. It is as what Marcia said, um, if we have a great center for global health, which we do, global is global and local. We need just to drive down the road. And we have a powerful historical relationship because we've all now raised our hand and pledged that we are at an Appalachian University. And we sit on the edge of those counties. And there are statutory obligations. When we decided we wanted control over our own money and our own HR and our own investment, um, we signed an agreement with the state after we got over the fact that maybe the state wasn't actually going to sell us the rotunda. In fact, as they said down there, you don't have enough money to buy the rotunda, sorry. Um, that we were going to be a state university, but we had a responsibility to a region that was underserved, and Appalachia is that region. We don't talk about that much. There's probably a lot of people in this room who don't know that we have to file a report with the governor and the legislature every year detailing our work in the area. But this is important. But equally important is the opportunity to make improvements, to change, to be a part of research with communities there, to, to advance education as we have with the college, to create business opportunities. And here it is again, to reset our moral compass to the Southwest. Why do we reset? Well, when you start to look at the circumstances of the region, and I'm going to paint a portrait just very quickly of the health status of the region uh, and the surrounding demographics. So look at that, man, the population is um, going down. Um, Elke and I just took a drive through West Virginia and every town we went in, the change in census from the previous population, from the previous census was devastating. You're losing at 4% Every 10 years, the population of a region, it's going away. Extinction becomes a real possibility. 
um, and the education gap. You know that only 9% of the residents of far southwest Virginia have a college education. Just you know, a few more get out of high school. Um, that 20% of the population lives in poverty. That the per capita income is only half. Um, that the, this lack of work number is changing dramatically. That picture you see beside <laughs> is of, of palace to entry it is uh, to energy. It's one of the great uh, cathedrals of power in this country, um, and that's in Clintwood, right? Dominion Power spent three billion dollars to build this coal-fired energy plant. Um, Twenty percent of the population is uninsured. Another reason why this state, in its infinite wisdom, rejected Medicaid as a solution for access to health care for this population. Um, in a very homogeneous uh, population that has some pretty funky health risk behaviors. Despair, lack of access, poverty leads to certain health determinants that we all know, we hear it all over and over again within poor communities. Tobacco played a major role along with coal. So you'd work, you'd mine your coal, but the other thing you would do is on your small piece of bottom land is you'd grow tobacco. And you'd harvest that tobacco at the end of the summer, you'd hang it up to dry, and guess when you would sell that tobacco? along about December 15th. And so there is embedded within the culture this understanding of tobacco as the money that put the turkey, Christmas turkey, on the table, that bought the presents, that got us a pair of shoes to get through another year. And so it's very hard when you look at these numbers. These are statistically significant numbers of the population who smoke and then to work in the mines and this whole swirl of chronic respiratory disease, if you look at this, 80 deaths per 100,000 adjusted from chronic lower respiratory disease compared to 38 per 100,000 for the rest of the state. Wow. And the other numbers. You know, think about living in a community where greater than 30% of your community is morbidly obese. Think about that. Greater than 30%. And I ask you to think about it because it's going to be this community. It's going to be every community in the United States. Look at the percentage with high blood pressure as a consequence, high cholesterol. Um, these issues are the canary in the coal mine, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's obesity. Um, I would ask you, because I, I didn't run it today because of time, but I ask you to go out and look at the CDC obesity maps. Put them into motion and look at what has happened between 1990 and 2015 in terms of the increasing numbers of the population who have body mass index greater than 30 uh, and where it originates from. And what you see is a colorful lighting up Hey, hey, West Virginia, let's rock and roll. We're leading it every time West Virginia lights up. And now you see they're at greater than 35% of their population. But there is no longer any states. This migrates out, whether it's the use of Oxycontin, whether it's unemployment, whether it is um, the issues of obesity and diabetes, they migrate out. Appalachia has always told us where we are headed. We best pay attention. They are a canary in the coal mine. hundred years ago, the gentleman that David photographed in the corner would have been in Barnum and Bailey Circus. And now they're common. And you see they're sitting there next to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, but the contradictions are powerful. In doing our health blueprint for the region, we talk to EMS workers and I asked them at the end of the discussion, what would you like to see? And the EMS worker said, I'd like to have one freaking week where I didn't have to use a piece of power equipment to cut a hole into a house in order to take a person out and take them to the hospital. Please, this is the world. These are our neighbors. So the maps light up. 
this is my impression, this picture. This is from Robert Wood Johnson and the University of Wisconsin and their county health maps, their county health readings. So whether you look at you know, education, employment, safety, physical environment, the things that lead up to poor health, uh, you can see that the rural areas of our country, of our state, south side and southwest, with a notable exception of Petersburg, which now lights up as number one, you know, or, or at the bottom, rather. Petersburg lights up at the bottom because the people that live in Petersburg are black. Um, and then you've got people in Appalachia, and that's the way our map looks. This is not the map we want to live in in the state, is it? But that's the way that the numbers play out. Whether it's heart disease or, or solid tumors or unintentional injury or diabetes, they lead the state in premature mortality. What's, and so you see the percentage of total deaths. What's the 2.8%? It's the population. That's health disparity. That's how you calculate it. That tells the story. Um, so you lead up to this. By the way, that picture there, prepare to meet God, that, uh, it's at the Norfolk and Western um, Coal Yards right outside of Williamson, West Virginia. Um, and you look at this rates of premature mortality in, in planning districts one and two compared to the death rate in the rest of the state. Geographic health disparity. And as I said earlier, when you then peel it away to look at the underlying mental health issues that affect the people of the region, um, suicide rates at, at twice the, the rate of the rest of the state. We have an extraordinary expert here I need to give a shout out to. He's not here today, but Larry Merkel, who has been working in Southwest Virginia in Appalachia and suicide for a number of years. And then there's this story called the unintentional fatal drug overdose rate, which is just an extraordinary story. So the average from the coal fields are 40 deaths per 100,000 adjusted compared to 8.3 in the state. These are people who are now taking fentanyl with their heroin and their moonshine who are dying in the emergency rooms in the homes of Southwest Virginia. This is the canary in the coal mine. When those death rates become true in Appalachia, they then start to spread out in their, the test, and, and I ask you to look at this test, is um, when fatal, unintentional fatal overdose rates exceed the number of people killed in, in automobile accidents in the state. And that's happening in state after state. And you know you're in trouble when you've got an acronym like FOAM that the state coroner can start referring to FOAM, fentanyl, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and methadone. So there's this map again as an impression look at the colors, look at the way it lights up. We're trying to figure out why Scott County, uh, which sits on the edge there at Bristol, uh, is not lit up. We were asking the question to VDH, and Kathy may know the answer to this question, but those people die in Tennessee, and I wonder if somehow the data from their deaths are recorded <laughs> in Tennessee. But, but that's an extraordinary extraordinary numbers and an extraordinary picture of our state. And so you begin to see from this map too, it's not just south side and southwest, that this fatal unintentional overdose rate also has a very direct relationship to the mountains. So that it all bundles up so that the counties of far southwest Virginia, the counties of south side, are all at the bottom of the heap. Uh, anybody want to know what um, Albemarle is? What's Albemarle in the big ranking? If there are 131 counties, 132 counties in Virginia, what's Albemarle County? Four. Fairfax would be one. Um, Petersburg would be 132. Uh, and then you go into southwest Virginia for the rest. And this has stood for year after year after year and something that we have to address as a health system. Because it stood for year after year after year, when you look at life expectancy and the impact, and this is a study uh, done out of the University of Washington, you begin to see that 
the life expectancy for women for the region is since the, this is the first time since the uh, Spanish influenza epidemic that you've had a decline in life expectancy. So that a woman in Southwest Virginia by this data is likely to die sooner than her grandmother, whereas that same woman living in Fairfax may live years longer. It's a life and death issue. Surrounding that is the number of disabled. What you're looking at there is another impressionistic map, this one from CMS, that's highlighting the numbers of people in this, in this region with disability, that is adults who are receiving Social Security disability. And once again, it lights up. Um, Virginia, and we should not be proud to say this, our coal counties in Virginia are all within the top 20 counties of the United States of America in the num percentage of population adults who are living on disability. Um, imagine you have 30% of your population that's obese, you have 30% of your population on disability, 30% of your population uninsured, access to hospitals, school, education limited. That's the environment. I love that place. I love being there. I love the people. We have to hold this contradiction that is a fabulous place of great and remarkable gifts, including this university. Um, and we have to find the balance between that and how we are active. Uh, very, very quickly so we can open to questions. I just want to say some of the things that we are working on. Uh, we have, we invite you, there's a number of my telemedicine colleagues. We have a lot of telemedicine connections in the region. We do great work. Um, our cancer center has um, the number one grant and with the Tobacco Commission for doing cancer control initiatives into the region. Um, our library has an outreach librarian who works in the region. We do great educational series. We have active training programs for nurse practitioners in the region. We engage in RAM. We do data collection. We have generated a health blueprint for the region. Um, we are involved in the uh, Clinch River Valley Initiative to create a new linear state park, Kirby, Clinch River Valley Initiative, a beautiful acronym. Um, but we do a lot of good work through our Appalachian Prosperity Project, through Healthy Appalachia, through the individual work of researchers and clinicians and providers and individuals here. But we've got to close the gap between 4 and 131. Uh, we have great goals to um, set the standards for community-based participatory research, to um, engage the students of the region to become health professionals, to do interdisciplinary collaboration, to reduce disease incidents. These are great and laudable goals, but they've been our goals for a long time, um, and the needle is not changing. And some of us, the one behind this pulpit in particular, is getting tired and want to hang up the coonskin cap. And so it is important to challenge the university and challenge our health system to what we do in the area. Um, last note, powerful song from the region which captures, I think, everything there is to say. Uh, for those of you who saw O oh Brother, Where Out Thou? Remember the Soggy Bottom Boys singing um, beautiful version of A Man of Constant Sorrow. It's a traditional arrangement. That's Dr. Ralph Stanley up there on the top, grandfather of bluegrass music. He made this song his own. But the sentiment in this song that I am a man of constant sorrow, I've seen trouble all my day, lives in the context of the only time that one breaks through that alienation and that loss um, is when one dies that dualism to say the only time I will be at peace is when I go to the golden shore, that it will not be in this world. Well, we have an opportunity to maybe interject hope by understanding contradiction, by engaging in the region, by understanding that if we are to be who we say we want to be, that community relationships are the rails upon which discovery runs. 
So one last thing. The flag. Uh, West Virginians are prone to hyperbole. Uh, I give that as a disclosure. Um, and that in the mythology of this place, there was a great game one day between the Cavaliers of Virginia and the Mountaineers of West Virginia University in Charlotte, North Carolina. The Continental Tire Bowl. Was anyone there? No. So at the Continental Tire Bowl, the, the uh, pep band decided at the end of the Continental Tire Bowl, or at the halftime, that they would do a halftime show that involved two kissing cousins dressed up in overalls, uh, chewing on hay, uh, to come out and get married, and that they would, as a symbol, they would put a ring around them, and that ring happened to be a Continental Tire, uh, which they did put around them, which led then to um, insults being hurled, um, and truly did lead to the, um, the pet band going away. We now have a marching band as a consequence of that. Um, the governor of Virginia had to apologize to the governor and the people of West Virginia. And this here flag that Leonard Sanders gave me flew over the capital in Richmond, Virginia. Mountaineers are born and die free. Marsha. <laughs> We have a quite generous amount of time for your questions and comments. Um, I think this talk has given us a multi-layered uh, look at the Appalachian region, and I, for one, will look at the mountains differently when I see them today. Thank you so much. Um, when I bring you, and we have another mic over there, when we bring you the mic, would you please identify yourself uh, before making your comment or asking your question? But we're curious what you all think with this powerful presentation. Yes. I'm Karen, Karen Knight. Um, thank you. It was a, it was a beautiful presentation. Um, I, because so much of health, of course, depends upon financial stability and everything seems to follow from the dollars. With the absence of the coal industry, do you see a new industry or new opportunities coming in for local um, development that will not be as detrimental to their health, hopefully? Well, I, it's a great question. Thank you. I, um, like with much of what we deal with here, it is um, compartmentalized if we talk about health separate from education and meaningful work. Um, Freud said we need two things in this life to be happy, work, and love. Um, and, I, and I take that very seriously. And I think the people, in, in order for Appalachia to be healthy, there needs to be that access to education, number one. And, and number two, I think um, meaningful work is important. Um, I would challenge the, the country that gave us the Manhattan Project and the moon and all those other things that we have an obligation to Appalachia because our wealth in the world sprang from that place that we need to look at it. it is, there is broadband moving in. There is opportunity for alternative industry. There's wonderful alternative industry for energy, uh, growing uh, bio, uh, fuels in those bottom lines, bottom land where uh, tobacco used to be, uh, to get advanced manufacturing in the region. Uh, you know, when Apple builds its new car, which it's going to release in 2019, I'd love to see them have their manufacturing plan in Appalachia. But we've got a long way to go, and with the decline of coal, it's the question of whether the the extinction of a culture will precede the good thing that can happen. Okay. Um, hello. My name is Claire Romaine. I'm a second year undergrad, and I grew up in Frostburg, Maryland, and I could bike my, ride my bike to West Virginia. Um, so my question to you is, you said about encouraging students who are from these underserved areas to become healthcare professionals. How do you encourage those students to then go back to places where they know that their kids won't have a good education and things like that? Thank you. One of the toughest questions. We love RAM here. We've loved it as being a part of it. But the year that Obama was first elected, the health 
um, the, the Washington Post magazine um, had as its cover of the healing fields and had pictures of Ram and the hospital systems and the business people of the region were enraged because it was getting in the way of their recruitment of physicians to come and live in these communities. It is, a, it is a conundrum of the highest order. So we have to see this problem as a generational problem, number one. Uh, we have started a program with the Healthy Appalachia Institute and in WISE where we do MedMatch. So we, med ma we match students in the region, uh, first and second year students in college, with first and second year medical students here. Uh, which we'll be talking to you about, uh, in order to serve as a mentor uh, to get them into medical school with the belief that generationally the only way we solve this is recruiting people back into the coal fields, providing benefit for those folks to be in Appalachia because it is home. That's the only way we will solve it. Folks will come and go otherwise, and I think health requires a steady relationship. And so we have to solve this generation. And it really begins with you. <clears throat> Carl Ayers, a professor emeritus. When I grew up in Appalachia, we were all fans of President Roosevelt. Uh, it was general, he was generally accepted. Uh, in more recent years, uh, that region has gone Republican. Yes. And we all know the Republicans don't support uh, health care for the poor. They don't support well education. But yet these people vote Republican. I just, and it's a change. And I don't understand it. Could you explain it? <laughs> <laughs> if I can nail that one, there are people who want to talk to me. Um, you, Dr. Hayes, you are, are pointing out one of the more powerful contradictions. They not only vote Republican, they put up big billboards down there that are very fierce in their opposition to Obama, to Democratic Party thinking, to policies that would support them, like the adoption of Medicaid, that they are vehemently opposed. What occurs is the process that gets people who are oppressed to vote against their own self-interest. They do not, and they do that by looking at social issues um, that cause their ire and their um, evangelical Christian heritage to get sparked up. You know, if you vote for a Democrat, you're going to have a Muslim in the White House, and they're going to take away everything you've got. And so people vote out of fear, and they vote out of um, this interest that corporations are going to be the ones that solve the issues of the people of Appalachia. They never have. They never will. It needs to be the people and the people's partners who change the way this is in Appalachia. Hi, I'm Penelope. I'm a medical student thinking about or going into psychiatry, and I also spend a lot of time in Pocahontas County. I have friends there. So, um, to me, then uh, the, the the part the part of health that really changes overall outcomes is changing behavior. Um, is changing people's uh, participation in preventive health, um, which is, you know, takes a lot longer than one weekend. You, I mean, you can't have a ram behavior health there. Um, how, what, and it, I think it, it actually is related to um, the professor, professor's question beforehand. How, what, what do you see as the best way to, or what programs do you see as the best way to get, get into changing behavior, changing health behavior? Um, in a place where you have to be very sensitive about um, not changing the culture. In a place where watching NASCAR is considered part of, you know, part of every weekend, where do you, how do you change behavior and talk about not having nacho cheese dip and getting outside and enjoying, you know, exercise? Great question. A um, couple of things about that. First of all, just let me say I'm a big Jeff Gordon fan. <laughs> He's in the chase this year. Uh, this is his last year racing. 
Um, it was a fine tradition of moonshining. These guys, their grandfathers were all moonshiners. They needed a place to run their fast cars on Saturday night, and, and it was a fabulous thing. But to your, to your real question, which is really very important, um, how do you get people to reconnect to their health? There was a time in which the people of Appalachia were about the outdoors. They were thin, wiry, uh, scrappy, long-living, fierce, uh, engine-fighting folks. That's who they were. Um, and so they understood a lifestyle that was very physical. And what's happened is when you are poor, the dollar value meal becomes the way that you eat. Um, and, and the lack of opportunity, the lack of education has drained them down into this place of great obesity, this explosion of diabetes and heart disease and unintentional injury. So how do we get them back to understand that health is right outside? That it is in the culture, that it is in the culture that they are from. There is good thing. Irony. I went to high school every day at Bluefield High School and my mom in my Beatles lunchbox, I'd have like a white bread sandwich and a Twinkie. And I was like living high. And and the, the kid from the coal mines would have his father's tin um, and in it would be some cornbread and some pinto beans. Who was eating better? <laughs> right? Um, but that's completely flipped now. And I think Appalachia is a great place for us to learn and so that the federal government and universities such as this one need to be in engagement with the culture and with the people to think through what a church night supper looks like, about how we live our lives in picnics and, and make think about our eating and our exercising and the world around it and tying that to economic opportunity. All those things swirl around. I have no solution to that but it is a it is a critical critical problem. Thank you for asking. Not to uh, let UVA off the hook because I appreciate very much your call to us to care about this and to figure out ways to be active and and engage with this region. Um, but I'm kind of curious, who, given that this is 2.8 percent of the Virginia population living in this area. Um, who advocates for Appalachia in the state legislature? Uh, do they constantly come up on the short end of state funding? I mean, even though the state has extracted much from for, the area, what goes back in? For the longest time, we had a fabulous bicameral, bipartisan group of legislatures from Southwest Virginia who were the strongest united front uh, in the legislature. And they did a good job of getting um, highways through and economic development money and coal field economic development money. And there is money there. Coal field, economic, coal field Development Authority has some money that could be used well. But over the, over the past several years, because of the redrawing of districts, uh, you have lost a couple of their key people um, because of the cap and trade vote. Rick Boucher was one of the great congressional voices and led to the wiring, the broadband wiring of Southwest Virginia. Outside of Alaska, it was the most wired region of the country. They voted him out of office because he voted for cap and trade. Um, so from a federal level and a state level, we have lost the legislative block that was imperative to us. We don't have that voice in Richmond anymore. Um, the compass is set to northeast, northeast, northeast. Before we go, I, I will remind people at this great Appalachian University, Captain Jefferson designed the Academical Village. He intentionally left the south end open and facing the mountains. So that call of David's to reset our moral compass to the southwest. Um, Jefferson had already done that. Uh, it's just that the New York architects closed it up. <laughs> so look over Cabell Hall and, and see, what, see what you find. Um, we hope that you'll come back next week. The place we'll be talking about 
is also a place with an uphill battle for good health, and that place is India. Uh, the program is called A River Runs Through, or A River Runs Again, um, Seeking a Healthier India, and we'll have science journalist Mira Sobermanian with us to talk about that. So we'll hope you'll join us there. It's another Global South program. So thank you so much, and thank you to the